Okay, and to get us started, just as a reminder, last week, this week, and next week, um, the strategy has been to look internally at some of the things that we've done well in the state. Uh, that recommendation actually came from all of you as we were looking at Tennessee and as we were looking sort of externally uh, at some of the research. Um, the question was, well, what kinds of things are happening in North Carolina that we ought to be, you know, elevating as, as exemplars for future actions? And so this panel, we're really excited because this is a very distinguished group of principals who have uh, addressed addressed a lot of the uh, challenges of being in low-performing schools. I think rather than me reading off who everyone is, if we could go down and have each of you introduce yourself. And several of you are uh, recipients of uh, some awards that if you don't mention, I will. But it would be nice for you to mention those because I think it is also really important to know that um, this is not only a distinguished group because of what they've done, but that they have also been recognized for a lot of the work that they've done. So let's go ahead and let the panelists introduce themselves, please. Hi, I'm Carrie Tolbert, and I'm the proud principal of Concord Middle School, which is located in Cabarrus County Schools. I've been there since July 1st, um, and we were designated as a low-performing school in October. Um, before that, I served as principal in Mooresville Middle School uh, for five years, so this is my sixth year as a school principal. I'm proud to be a North Carolina Teaching Fellow, which our North Carolina Public School Forum sponsored for many, many years. Woo -woo! Best of best. Um, I went to Meredith College and then pursued my master's at Gardner-Webb and then went to Wingate for my doctorate. Um, and a former English teacher, I guess I'll always be a teacher at heart, I'm just a teacher of adults now instead of a teacher of students. Um, I have two baby boys, a third grader, and then a toddler, two-year-old, his favorite word is no. Um, that's so much fun. <laughs> so I prefer to spend my days with middle school kids sometimes. Um, I love middle school. I think they're awesome. Um, they're smelly and stinky and full of attitude and sassiness, but they make every day absolutely wonderful, and I think they're awesome. I'm um, also the 2014 North Carolina Principal of the Year, and um, I think that's pretty much everything. Um, okay. My name is Christy Thomas. I'm a principal in Union County at Rockcrest Elementary. Um, our school was labeled about five years ago um, as a, a bottom 5% school, so we went through transformation with Dr. Pat Ashley, and she provided great guidance for us, and we worked our way out of transformation, and we're now longer, no longer being transformed by the state, but we're trying to transform ourselves. I'm Rusty Hall. I'm the principal at Old Town Elementary School, a low-performing school in Winston-Salem. Um, I'm the current Winston-Salem for South County Principal of the Year. Uh, this is my ninth year as an administrator. Um, we are a very special school uh, with some challenges. We're 100% free and reduced lunch, about 75% Hispanic population. Um, and so um, the designation of low-performing has really changed our focus on how do we address uh, the needs of our students from poverty um, and what special circumstances they come to us with and so that's been a major focus for us this school year. Good evening my name is Jacqueline Williams I'm the principal of Pittman Elementary School it's in Halifax County Schools I've been in school leadership for eight years um, I started as a middle school teacher then I was an assistant principal at Northwest Halifax High School for two years assistant principal at Enfield Middle School, and then the principal there for two years, and now I'm in elementary education. This is my third year at Pittman Elementary School. I am the county's 2015-16 principal of the year, and our school, although we're in a low-performing school district, has not been deemed low-performing. Um, we're actually the best performing elementary school in our county, and that includes the other school districts that are within Halifax County, um, with over 63% of our students being proficient. And we are one of those schools that um, we're not fortunate enough to have a lot of resources. So some of the conversation that we've had with other leaders that have come into our building and with teams is how we were able to do that with um, less resources. 
So I've been on both ends where I've been at a SIG school where there was lots of money and I've been now at a school where there's not a lot of money and I've seen um, how things work on both ends of the spectrum. So, and I'm glad to be here. Great, thank you everyone. So the panel's gonna, or the audience is gonna have a chance to respond to you later, but I'd like to start by asking you to respond to what you heard from the audience. Let's pick up with that same question about the school grade calculations and the, the idea of what is a low performing school. What do you think about those two policy issues? What should we be doing in North Carolina about those two things? I agree with a lot of what was said. I think I think it starts with with the way we assess our students, and, and this one time assessment um, is the basis for it. I mean, if if we're going to look at changing um, a, a system, we've got to kind of start at the basic level. And so, is the assessment fair? Um, you know, from an elementary school, is just the fact that you know only fourth and fifth grade kind of total and third grade reading play in a part of a school of of kindergartners through fifth graders and so half of my school is not playing into the success or the failure of, of what's happening so so that's a concern and, and I agreed um, with this table when they were talking about um, looking at our, our lowest and our highest kids and and when you break down our data because because we are low performing we're a D we had uh, we did not make growth um, and you look at it and it's, it's hard for me as, as, as a caring principal uh, to not focus on our low babies and, and not focus on, on what they need and, and our growth with our low kids is, is off the chart um, and, and we're moving kind of systematically so I, I don't think the current system plays a role or uh, gives enough attention to time and uh, to time to turn around a school um, and and the negativity that comes with that low performing kind of pushes back on us. Um, I have an F school and, a, and a, um, also a low-performing school, and it took a lot of work to get there. Um, I'm the fourth principal in five years, and I heard Courtney over there saying she's the third principal in three years, uh, taking over a low-performing school, and um, it happened very purposefully. There was a lot of turnover, a lot of teachers left, were in and out. Um, how can your students be proficient when they've had four teachers in one year and they're not learning any math? Like, you, you can't expect anything different. Um, I do believe that our state can support low performing schools. Um, I think the bigger picture is the A through F grading scale. I think that's a huge issue right now, especially in the mixed messages that our educators are receiving when we as educators are, are graded on growth as part of our evaluation and schools are not. Um, it's only 20% of the entire formula. So I think that's a huge mixed message that a lot of our community members don't realize um, that growth should be the emphasis when you're taking in students from all over the place that do not have books at home and have never seen a book before in their life until they get to kindergarten. So I think that those things need to be taken into consideration. Um, I do believe we have a lot of good work ahead of us as a school that will show growth soon, but it's not going to happen in two years. And I think our um, state legislators need to understand that it's going to take three to five years for our school to get out of its low performing school status because um, you have to have somebody that sticks around and teachers that stick around and you have to have consistency and you have to have high expectations and excellent leadership from your teachers as well as your administration. We, um, dis go ahead. we um, discussed the fact that for our benchmarks we use adaptive assessments. Our district uses MAP um, from NWEA. So we have students who may be um, showing growth of 20 points plus from beginning of the year data to end of the year, but when they take the end of the year test from the state, that still equates for them because they're so far behind to the lowest level one on the scale. So you have students who you can celebrate 20 points of growth and they're by what the measure says they should be doing according to how they perform, they're meeting it, but the end of the year assessment it's unrealistic that there'll be a level three or four without some years of being able to catch up on some of the things that they did not get. And we know that that can do, be due in part to a lot of different factors. Teaching, um, the change in assessments from year to year, and so trying to get people in who truly understand what it looks like to teach a common core lesson so that the students are able to take the test at the end of the year. 
Well, you know, all of your answers really speak to a human factor here, and, and um, I think one of the issues and concerns I've had and I've heard other people raise, but I'd like to hear from you, from your perspective, what is the impact on the kids when or if they find out they go to a failing school or a school with an F? For us, when we, when we started this process, we didn't have A's through F's. Uh, it was five years ago. And what we decided to do when we walked into Rockrest was we didn't care that everyone called it low performing. The first thing we did was to sit down with what was left and we said, guys, um, we're going to talk about what's great about Rockrest. And we're going to begin that process with our kids and talking about what's great with Rockrest. And even now, um, we, you know, we don't spend a lot of time on... Uh, we're a, we were a B school the first year, we're a C school now. Our kids could care less. At the end of the day, what they care is there's a teacher in the classroom and that teacher cares about them and that teacher shows up every day and that teacher motivates them. And then we can show them the progress they're making throughout the year and we can say, look, look what you're able to do now that you weren't able to do at the, end, at the beginning of the year. And then all of a sudden there's celebrations and everybody's screaming because kids are seeing the progress. And I'm glad the adults are concerned about it, but the kids need to know, hey, you're amazing. Doesn't matter what shade you are, you're amazing. And in this building, we're going to do great things because you come to school every day and give your best. My students um, do not realize on an everyday basis that we're in F school. Um, a reporter from WUNC actually came to our school a couple weeks ago and just chatted with some kids and said, hey, what would you grade Concord Middle School if you could give it a grade? And the kids were very kind in saying that they'd give us a B or a C and they're teenagers. And then the reporter said, well, how do you feel if I'm telling you right now that the state of North Carolina deems you as an F school? And the kids were shocked. They were like, what? How is that even possible? Which I was like, ooh, okay, that's nice. <laughs> hey, the kids actually think good things. But in the same respect, what they do feel is when there's high teacher turnover. Um, that's been a huge issue in my school. And it's very difficult to recruit teachers to a low-performing school. Um, the teachers that really are effective and that want to be there feel a purpose and a mission to be there. Um, but the teachers, maybe young teachers who are right out of college that maybe don't have the tool belt yet nor the commitment or are unsure of where they need to be or even some other teachers that, you know, just for whatever reason need to leave for personal reasons, there's a high turnover rate in low-performing schools. And um, they feel um, the teachers leaving. And I have one math classroom that's on their third math teacher, and the students are um, were not behaving great at the beginning of the year, but now they're angels. And one of my assistant principals said, well, you know, what's going on? I'm really impressed with your behavior. Though. We just don't want the teacher to leave. That's all. We don't want our teacher to leave. Um, and that just about made me cry when the kids said that because they are feeling that part more than the F school status. Um, as a principal trying to recruit teachers to my school, it's very, very challenging because we're a high poverty school. Um, so giving teachers a reason to come to my school and they don't get paid any more than a teacher from a high performing school that's meeting growth or exceeds growth um, is again challenging. So that's what my kids feel more than anything else. That was me four years ago um, when the test was renormed and um, we had gotten rid of teachers who, you know, were deemed low performing teachers or teachers who were just not cutting. And so we ended up with about eight teachers leaving or being removed. And so the challenge was recruiting teachers into those positions and most of them were reading and math positions which were crucial for middle school children and we ended up not um, filling so many of those positions so you had children who had someone come in and then they left and you had a sub so the biggest piece in those situations um, is to build a culture and keep the kids in a place where they still enjoy school even though there's not a lot of um, from an administrative perspective, there's a whole lot of challenges in that. And you know that at the end of the year, the state says, uh, if you're not you know, at a certain level, you're gonna be low performing, you'll be gonna look at as a low performing administrator. That's a big challenge. So you know, not only is it pressure for the teachers and the students as an administrator, you're responsible for all of that. And the biggest challenge in that is making sure that you seek and find ways to encourage the students and the staff 
to just move forward, even though if you hear that you're low performing or you have an F or your school is the lowest in your district. And so that, that was me four years ago. So one of the things that's come up already about what you all have emphasized of how to improve the achievement in the school is for teacher stability. So I have a two-part question about that. The first part would be kind of what policies could change that would help you with teacher stability? Pay, grading scale, whatever. Tell us what you think on the policies. And then short of that, what have you learned about how to keep teachers in your school when you don't have those policy changes in place? I think my answer to that is, is connected. I, I'm big in, in, in my belief of teacher leadership. Um, and so not only am I trying to create uh, powerful teachers, I'm trying to create powerful leaders as well amongst my staff. Um, so I, I believe that, that things grow from the ground up. Um, and so I find my strong teachers and, and I build leadership skills with them. And, and anything we try to do is very grassrootsy and, and, and comes up from within the staff. Um, so I, I think pay is a big issue. Um, you know, pay these teacher leaders to take on these leadership roles. Um, but in talking to my staff, it's not so much pay as in dollars. I mean, it'd be nice, but none of us went into this thinking we were going to be rich. I, I think the pay is connected to respect. Um, and I think that the way teachers are treated doesn't feel respectful. And that gets connected to money, I think, because that's an easier conversation to have. Um, but I really feel like teachers don't feel respected in, in what they do. Um, and especially those teachers that seek out and come to Old Town that, that want the challenge of working with, with kids from poverty. Um, and then to keep getting this negative, negative, negative all the time is, is a difficult task for me as the school leader to keep positive and to keep bringing up. Um, you, you know, the question was, do our kids know? Um, not so much, but our teachers know. Um, and, and they lose sleep and I lose sleep over them knowing uh, that we're low performing and having to get up and tell them one more time something bad or getting up one more time to tell them uh, a change or anything like that. It's, it's really hard. Um, to do, and, and I'm proud that our teacher turnover rate has been very, very good since I've gotten there, and and I think we talk about it and we, we build our teachers up, um, but there's only so much we can do within our school building, within our school district, um, to to garner the respect that, that teachers need. Uh, I think I agree with the pay. I also agree that we need to look at the experienced teachers and pat them on the back. Uh, because those experienced teachers, we need them in our buildings. Our buildings are young with young teachers, and they're great. But I need that 10th year teacher who understands how to deal with that difficult, tricky child and who understands that it's going to take till 5.30, 6.30 at night, and you're still going to be there, and you may have to get there at 5.30, and you may have to schedule a conference with the parent three times because they've got chaos in their house, and they can't help that they're going to miss three conferences. And if you just have those first and second year teachers, while they're wonderful, you need the maturity of that 10th, 11th, and 12th. And you also need the rhetoric of the legislators and all the public to understand teachers are not the enemies. If we didn't have teachers, we couldn't have, we'd have schools, kids would be there, but we as administrators couldn't serve all of them. And teachers are doing a yeoman's job. I watch teachers every day, and they hear the rhetoric out there about the job they're doing, and they still come, and they still work hard, and they look us in the face and say, I do it for these kids. But also, when I have teachers working two jobs or three jobs, come on, guys, how many of us want to work two jobs and three jobs and then have to come home and do paperwork and anchor charts and all the things that they do. So at the end of the day, yeah, let's reward our experienced teachers. And yes, let's make sure our rhetoric honors the work they do. And if you don't, if we don't understand the work they do, come do their job. Come chase five-year-olds one day. You won't do it. Come chase 11-year-olds who are struggling and they're facing difficult things at home and they bring that anger to school because it's a safe place to bring the anger. It's not an easy job. And these experienced teachers hold these buildings together and they don't get the honor that they do and they deserve it because if they weren't there, the first and second year teachers wouldn't make it. They need that maturity to be, navigate the day. 
I, of course, am always very interested in, in the teacher pipeline issues. Uh, the other challenges we have are with resources. And I guess I also have a two-part question. One is about what resources have, has your school received that you feel really made a difference and how did they make a difference? And, and the other part of this question is the pie in the sky part. Or, you know, what are the resources that you would love to have that could make a really big difference for you? Um, I guess for me, in my current situation, I would say that the resources that have made the biggest difference have been um, the human capital. Fortunately, the school has a very low turnover rate, and many, many of the teachers have been there at least um, eight plus years. So there's a lot of teachers that are invested in the children and the community. So I was able to capitalize on that. And because the school is small, um, a lot of the larger resources we don't receive because when you start giving things out according to ADM and all those other numbers, um, we don't get a lot. So what I had to do is invest in those teacher leaders and they write grants and partner with my PTA and they write grants. And so it's those small things that you bring in to help make a difference. And I think I had to look at it in the reverse. When I was at a larger school with more money, I was looking like at a rainbow. I just had a, all of these things from one end to the other that we could possibly do because we had money. And so then when that was essentially chopped down to almost nothing, I had to reverse it and look at what do I need to make the largest impact? And how much of it do I need? And so once I did that, my focus was dead on what we needed to help make the school be successful. Um, and the dream that we always have when we talk about this in our school improvement team meetings is just to be able to have more human capital because ADM dictates one thing, but I think it's unfair for a teacher to have 29 fourth graders. Mm -hmm. You know, you could be more successful if you could chop that in half. She could be more focused. So for me, it would be human capital. And then with the resources that we buy, um, it could be an even focus because now that teacher can take what she has as a resource and focus on it as opposed to the fact you have 29 children to try to use these resources with. And before you relinquish the mic, because I do want to hear from the other folks, but just as a follow-up, one thing we heard last week was um, the, the challenge of the rainbow, that sometimes you have you know, 57 different professional development opportunities and you know, all sorts of, of things that that you know actually really take you away from being able to stay focused on sort of a, a community approach to to real challenges. So thinking back to the rainbow that you had before, were there any pieces of that rainbow that were more helpful for you, and others that just were like busy work? Um, I think when I reflect, I think some of the pieces that were more beneficial to me were the um, professional development that as a leader, I was afforded. Because we were part of the school transformation with Dr. Ashley and her team five plus years ago. So I've been in administration since the onset of that. So I think um, looking at all the monies and all the other things, the focus then should have been on capitalizing on the, P, the professional development so that as a new leader, I could have taken all of that and grown into this place where I can look at all those resources and easily determine what didn't fit for me. So now I'm better equipped to determine what fits for my school. You can have a thousand resources, but if it doesn't fit for your school, there's no need to invest in it because it's the buzz. I think with resources, um, I do agree. We've had resources, and I do agree that um, we have to be wise in the way that we use the resources. Um, sometimes it seems as if there are more strings attached sometimes with resources and regarding how they're used. 
And you always, when you're dealing with, and, and we're a school of, you know, not 100%, but something, 89, I don't know really what it is. It changes each day. A new child comes in, you go, oh, what? But I think the reality is, is being able to divide those resources among all the children because sometimes it seems you're squeezed because the need becomes mightier at times and, and you're looking for that teacher and you can't find that teacher or you're, you're looking for that person to come in and help the children. So sometimes it's being able to use those resources in a more flexible manner. And then in Union County, I do appreciate our superintendent really takes care of the need schools um, and so she's always trying to squeeze a dollar out. And then with Dr. Ashley, when we were under the, uh, the school uh, transformation process, it, uh, we had, uh, when, we, when we exceeded, we had that surprise. I didn't even know we were getting it. And we had that surprise bonus for teachers. And that meant such a big deal to the teachers. So I think resources is something as principals you always would like more, but you're always appreciative of what you have but, and you want to use them in a wise manner. So I appreciate the way you said that. We do want to be uh, very wise in the way we use them, but we, when you have need, you're always looking for hands and helpers to come in and touch those children's lives because you, it's adults you need. It's not always programs that you need. I would agree with that. I'm not a Title I school, although we are 73.03% um, free and reduced lunch, 16 kids away from being a Title I school. Um, not that we're counting or anything, but um, if we did have more resources, then I would invest it in human capital. Um, when you have a sixth grade math class that is 9% math proficient on grade level, um, then I need more trained teachers to work in small groups. When my students do not know how to multiply, regular numbers, they can't multiply fractions. So um, trying to help them get up to grade level, and that's not our elementary school's fault, that's just how our kids come to us. I'm not blaming that on anyone, but I need more adults that know what they're doing um, to help our students in that small group instruction. And in middle school, that's a little more rare. Um, elementary schools do a great job of that, um, but middle school is a little bit more of a beast to turn around in that direction when you have a class of 30. Um, that are staring at you and you tend to be more whole group oriented. I agree. I think human capital is, is probably our biggest expense uh, with our Title I budget, um, but our most needed. And I've, I've, I'm lucky in a sense that I've been on both sides in the same county. I've been in a more affluent school and now I'm in a Title I school. <clears throat> and I was the principal sitting in the back of the room saying, oh, so-and-so gets all the money. Um, you need it. I mean, it's just a simple fact of when 80% of your kindergartners come to you below pre-K level, um, you need people. I mean, you whether you got 18 kids in the classroom or you got 20 kids in the classroom, it can never be small enough to reach the needs of those kids. And it starts in kindergarten, it starts in first grade and in second grade. Um, and, and so my budgeting philosophy has been to, to flood those grade levels with with the resources they need whether it's material whether it's 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 human capital and 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 really learning from that but i think it starts with your school improvement plan and knowing what you need knowing what your your data tells you you need and being able to build upon that um, i had the chance last year um talking about your second part of your question of of you know the magic um it, I had a, a volunteer come to me and say, I, I see what's happening at your school and, and I can sense something amazing is gonna happen here. And he says, I wanna support that, however you need. And in a busy school, I said, thanks, you know, let's let's talk. And a couple weeks later, he emailed me again. Let's, let's talk, I wanna help you, I wanna help you. And finally showed up one day at my door in, in, in the summer and, and he, said, he said, if we're gonna change the world, I wanna be part of this, let's do it. Um, and he said, I don't care what it costs, if you could do one thing, what would it be? Um, and that kind of took me back. And, you know, you think the things, you think the, the technology, the, you know, how big, is, how big are we thinking? And, and uh, that's what really got us started in the poverty study and, and, and having the opportunity through uh, his donation to our school to, to build a toolbox to address poverty, and I don't think as a as a state and as a um, our teachers in their prep classes, I don't I don't think we spend enough time talking about what poverty does to students and to kids, and I don't think um, I think we get lost in the the reasons behind poverty, and we're afraid to talk about it. Um, 
but you you take a kid from poverty and you look at their MRI of their brain, it looks different than a kid from middle class. And it's our job to fix it. And, and it's simple as that. And and so I had the opportunity, and I'm lucky that, that we got to, to, to have um, Eric Jensen, who's kind of a leading um, educational brain poverty researcher, come to my staff, work with us over the course of a year to really make a difference. And, and the things that we're doing now, we know brain-based teaching, we're making a difference. And, and so some of the stipulations that come with some of this money won't, wouldn't allow you to do that. And, and so I think we've got to start advocating more uh, for our students of poverty and, and not worry about why they're in poverty. Um, not worry about if parents are, are legal or not. They're in my school. I've got to teach them. I've got to make them better citizens, and, and it's, it's a challenge. That was great, Rosie, because you answered the question that I was going to ask next. So good job. So that means it's the uh, turn of the Before audience. Before we turn it over to them, I have one final sort of quick question to ask you guys. And you can go down the row and just, you know, this is like a two or three maybe word answer. Um, you all have been rewarded and awarded for being outstanding leaders. And one of the themes that we also hear throughout the conversations is how important um, teachers and principals are, especially that school leader, for supporting and developing the kind of schools that can really pull themselves up by the bootstraps. And, you know, the turnaround school phrase is a little overused here, but the, a good turnaround principle. What made you a good turnaround principal? In two or three words. <laughs> yeah, in, in briefly. Yeah, maybe not three words, but. <laughs> that could be counted as four if you, you know, contracted I am. <laughs> I grew professionally. Serious about the three words? No, I'm not sure. Okay, that's three. It can be more than three. <laughs> okay. Right. So can I? But I love that. I, I love how you reduced it. Uh, can I take just thirty seconds to explain the professional piece? I had this conversation um, when I was doing the regional interview process for Region One Principal of the Year, and some of the things that I can attribute to the success where I am now is taking the time to enroll myself in professional learning opportunities like distinguished leadership and practice. Um, I got to work with different principals from across the state and it was a real experience where we could just have conversation about what's going on in our schools, how we can change it. It was nothing that was um, fixed. It was real. The presenters had gone through these things, so we had we walked away with real solutions to real problems in our buildings. And then also being a part of school transformation. In the beginning, it seemed like overbearing, and it was a lot. And okay, why am I choosing to still stay with school transformation? But the professional development, um, I think, was crucial because again, you came together and you were getting solutions and work on some of the problems that you were having and as a principal when you go back and apply those things from those experts I call them who had gone through this process it works but you have to look at what works for your school and adopt those things and then stay on that trail. I think for me it was um, making it safe to take risks um, that obviously everything we've, we've tried to do for these kids hasn't worked. Um, and allowing teachers who are the experts with those kids the opportunity to explore their learning and explore student learning um, to make a difference. And I think I'm a, I'm a good relationship builder. And, and having that safe relationship with teachers and with parents and with, te with students and with support staff to know that we're not going to get better by doing the status quo, and we've got to take risks. Um, uh, first, I love kids. I hate failure, um, and I love to prove people wrong. 
Um, and I enjoy this process of working with a team of folks who are smarter than me, and every day I get to learn something new. And at the end of the day, it's the best job. I definitely agree it's the best job. I don't know if I'm a good turnaround principal yet. Um, so I'll be completely honest and say you might regret asking me to be here in a year. I don't know. Um, I sincerely hope not, and our benchmark data hasn't shown that yet. But um, I think what may make me a good educator is that I have a huge sense of urgency about me. So the reason why I chose to come to Concord Middle School, although I loved where I was, um, was because when I was told that they had had so much turnaround and I was told those scores, I felt like it was a moral imperative for me to go to that school, that those kids, which are now my kids, but at the time they were those kids, but they're my kids now, they deserve an excellent education. And so I have a sense of urgency to help facilitate that process for them. I myself am not providing them that education because I'm not a teacher of children, but my students deserve to have the very best, and I want to ensure that they have that. So I want to find the very best teachers in every classroom in my building where I could say, well, my own child will be in that classroom, and I feel comfortable with that. So my mission every day when I wake up is to give them the best because they don't always have that in every area of their life. So um, I guess that's what makes me just a good educator. I don't know if it's a good turnaround principle or not. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> I'm a little nervous. <laughs> uh, from this recovering school, Superintendent, thank you very much for what you do each and every day. We are, let's give them a round of applause. They are incredible, fabulous. Thank you, thank you. Um, so you talked, each of you talked a lot about the human capital piece. And at our table, we talked about teacher assistance as part of the human capital. Middle school is one thing, elementary school is another. Broadly talk about the teacher assistance role, what the impact has been on that, and specifically, what kind of human capital, what are you looking for people to do in the human capital area? And I'm just going to moderate here and say, let's take maybe one, two answers for each of these questions so we try and get through all the tables in the time we have left. So from a middle school perspective that traditionally doesn't have teacher assistance ever, um, I would use that human capital for tutors or teacher assistants. Realistically, I know I can't use it for teachers, and I get that, and I understand. I don't expect our whole funding formula in the state of North Carolina to change. But I would kill for tutors or teacher assistants in my classroom. Um, in the past, in my former school, I was able to be a little creative with some uh, remediation money in which I got... Um, kids fresh out of college that maybe had a math degree and that could teach some math on the side before they got their real job or whatever. Um, and I would love to get that type of thing in a middle school math classroom where I could have more small group instruction. Um, and if I had an inclusion class with three adults in it, oh my goodness, that would be amazing to have um, three adults on 30 instead of two adults on 30 or even one adult on 30. Um, and we've gotten creative and you do get creative in education. I think that's the beauty of being a principal is you can get creative and say, well, I'm going to have my media assistant do this if I have a media assistant um, or I'm going to have my media specialist help with this and do some co-teaching with classes um, that 20 years ago that would have never happened. You know, it's just a library and you don't have them teach. Um, at least at secondary level. So um, I would love to have teacher assistance from the secondary perspective um, because I think, again, there's a lot of lessons that secondary school can learn from elementary school. And I think, uh, first of all, we call them teaching assistants, not teacher assistants, because their role is not to support the teacher but to support the students. Um, we're big believers in the uh, MTSS, RTI process at Old Town, um, and our teacher assistants um, that we hire, our teaching assistants that, that are allotted to us uh, are working with small groups constantly. They are on the move uh, all day working in this classroom, in this classroom, in this classroom. Um, not to mention the need of having teaching assistants for the, the needs of just my kindergarten. Um, so it, it's, it's an important factor. We use them um, as, as part of a, a, our tier two interventions. We use uh, reading mastery and corrective reading. Um, full scale through the whole school, uh, which is a very scripted program that we found a lot of success in and getting our students fluent in reading um, because uh, teaching assistants can just go through and do these scripted things 
Um, and you know, we started out, we had 300 kids qualify, half our school qualify for reading mastery, corrective reading. We've gotten that down to about 100 kids now. Um, and those, those folks have come in and done it, um, freeing up uh, my EC teacher, my, my, my classroom teacher's time um, to get into that more specialized stuff. You guys did a wonderful job, thank you. Um, we were wondering at our table, there's a lot of national conversation about the need for more flexibility. And even in some of the model state models, the innovation zone, uh, a lot of people say we just need to let schools go and give them more flexibility and they'd be more likely to be able to turn around. So if you could have any flexibility that you wanted that could help you uh, to continue improving, what would that be? Anytime you want to give me flexibility, I'll take it. Um, and I love flexibility. Um, and, and for us at Rockcrest, the flexibility comes in is that we feel that we have this passion and we understand where we need to take our children. So where he's using corrective reading, we don't want to use corrective reading. We don't want to use TRC and Dibbles. We don't want to do some of this kindergarten assessment. We want to be able to focus on the instruction assessment with that we think best will grow our kids in the direction that we want them to grow. And so when you talk about, I, you know, I was lucky. I worked under Dr. Ashley and I met with her one summer and begged her for flexibility. And she gave me that flexibility because the first year under school turnaround was cumbersome to me. I, I can remember going to the first meeting and someone came up and said, I'm your school coach. And then someone said, I'm your instructional coach. And I thought, when did I become stupid? Why do I need all this? And the reality is flexibility, and if you give us, our teachers and us, the empowerment, you can hold us accountable. Uh, as our superintendent always says, I'm going to give you the rope, use it to your good. If not, I'll pull it in. And the reality is that flexibility gives us the opportunity to take risk. It gives us the opportunity to try things out. It gives us an opportunity for someone like us. We don't want a program. We just want to be able to take what we know, use the standards, and we're going to grow kids. Um, and I think that if you, if you, if we will trust people, and I understand when we put restrictions in, it's because this school's failing, so everybody else has to pay a price for that. But come on, if she speeds, I don't think all of us should deserve a ticket. So at the end of the day, I support flexibility and appreciate that. Thank you. Yes, I would. And TRC. Just to be clear. Okay, our question is a little different because we already talked about the flexibility too, but what do you need from your district office that you are not getting? And it's kind of a two-parter. And along with that, how can we as our group help with those priorities? I feel incredibly supported from my district office. Um, I, I don't always feel incredibly supported from our state legislators, um, no offense, <laughs> um, nor um, always NCDPI. And, and I think it's just because the reality of what we're doing every day is not always tangible. Um, and I get that. I, I don't blame um, NCDPI nor our legislators. Um, I just wish that people understood reality of mental health issues of um, you know just dealing with all the baggage that our children come in with every day that, that they don't deserve at all um, but they do deserve a good education and so um, it's not a local issue at all maybe our local politicians um, but not a local district level from my perspective I agree I, I think I feel we feel supported in, in our district uh, got great leadership uh, there um, but then it then there's limitations to how much support and how much flexibility they can give us um, and, and I agree uh, wholeheartedly that that we don't feel supported um, just from our conversation when we first got here with our letter grades and our low performing labels the last thing a school like mine needs is a label that's going to make it tougher for me to get good teachers um, and good support in, into my building um, and and forcing me to hire young teachers who data shows they don't get good growth from their students. They're not supposed to get good growth from their students. It's their first year. Um, so it's a catch-22. Um, I'm getting that 
pushback and having to go with, with younger teachers, which is great because I love to build the kind of teacher I want. Um, but it, but there again, they're, they're not expected to perform that of a veteran teacher. Um, I guess my answer would address the other flexibility answer and then what you're talking about from the state. Um, the flexibility and understanding that numbers shouldn't dictate people. So, you know, because the school is small, shouldn't determine whether or not um, they should have 30 kids crammed in a room because if you add them up collectively, 30 through 50, you have X amount of children. So that means 2.3 teachers, and I don't know where you get a point three from. But, you know, it, it, it's just not fair because even children need the same amount of time and um, resource as kids who are in a school that have a thousand children. Because if you're looking at schools where children are performing below grade level, how much sense does it make to have 30 of them in a classroom with one teacher and then um, with the pressures of having to grow them, the teachers, or have them out, you know, that's kind of like a double-edged sword. So I want to grow, I want to be able to have the time to grow the teacher and support them in the way they need to be supported so that they can be great teachers who can eventually lead the building to a higher place of achievement, but that takes time. They just can't come in and be accomplished and distinguished um, at the start of the race. You know, we need some flexibility, some time in helping them grow and be great teachers. And I would just say what we need um, is this continual dialogue. I admire you so much taking your times to do this. And this celebration of public and public education, it works. Uh, every day I get the privilege um, to go in a building of lots of need, and yet we get to... Because our goal is not just growth. We're going to get kids on grade level. We're, gonna, we're not just going to sit here and celebrate 10 points. We want grade level proficiency. We want kids on grade level. We want them to walk out. And, and the best moments for a principal is when you get those test results and you get to walk down the hall and you get to whisper in a teacher's ear and they run in and you see the tears in their eyes as kids for the first time ever first time ever have passed an assessment whether we agree in the test or not that celebration of a job well done and we get to do that and so we appreciate you having the conversation but the celebration of public schools they're not bad they're great organizations where all people come i don't get to decide you don't get to come today or all on the 20th day i get to say no my doors are open and 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 why we don't celebrate that i, I don't get it but i do know it is the best place because we take all and we have the responsibility to grow those. And so thank you for talking in a public school forum about public schools. So here's our question. <clears throat> what would you be doing differently if there were no A through F grades in North Carolina? Personally, I'd have more time to be the instructional leader in my school um, because the past three months have been spent making sure everybody had an observation and a mid-year summative. Uh, additional observations that would change in the middle of the cycle, so I'd have to go back and do several more. I feel like I'm not giving my teachers, and, and we value coaching at my school as a former coach, I brought that in, and, and my curriculum coordinators and, and my AP and I, we value coaching, and I'm missing that. Um, I go home sad most days because my time in a classroom has been spent filling out a form and not really looking at what I can give that teacher to make her or him better. Um, I think I would probably spend more time exposing the children. You know, we have those field trips that are few, far, and in between, but giving them the opportunity to see the state, you know, now that we're not even talking about the world or other states, but still in the state of North Carolina, outside of the rural 
um, areas of Halifax, you know, from the mountains all the way to the coast, giving them opportunity to know that the state is great and there's a lot here to explore. We are going to be making some recommendations as a body coming out of this experience, and we're just wondering what's one recommendation you really want to see in our plan that would give you the greatest sense of hope for your kids and your district. I think what's been said several times in varying ways is um, showing respect for teachers that choose to work in a low performing school. Um, and for the people that, again, are making that choice every day to come in and work with students that are struggling more. Um, again, my teachers could easily leave any day to go to a school that's high performing. And not that I'm saying it's an easier job in a high performing school, it's a different job. Um, but there's a lot of emotional investment um, that is m more in a, in a low performing school and a high need school. And um, I think. The, the teachers that work in those schools need to be affirmed and encouraged um, and just said thank you for doing this in some way shape or form instead of being demoralized and I would say as the leader in that school the same thing when my time is spent on paperwork and additional observations that do not make a difference in student learning whatsoever um, then I feel demoralized a lot of times. So Carrie, we could make a recommendation that the state of North Carolina show more appreciation for you and for your teachers, and we could recommend that all the leaders in the state do that. That would be great. It's, is there something that's more tangible that we could do to show that appreciation and respect? Um, even though time. teachers do not go into it for money, I, that's, that's tangible, um, and it is a reward, and um, it does show teachers that they are being rewarded for a good job. Um, I also think, and I think I'm more of an outlier in saying this, but um, there are some poor teachers in low-performing schools. There is a reason why there is there a low-performing school. There are some poor teachers in my school. Um, that's what happens when you have four different principals in five years because you have a lot of different hiring practices. Um, I would love to have every teacher in my school on a one-year contract to help encourage um, a sense of urgency about it um, and that my teachers are evaluated every year knowing that my job is important in this school because we're a low performing school but if they get that one year contract then they are rewarded monetarily for it that's that's I think I'm an outlier in that thinking and I'm still new to the low performing school arena so please keep that in mind but I don't hope it didn't offend anybody with that but um, that's just my thinking is that that would help create more of a sense of urgency because our kids aren't learning they aren't and they will be learning, but they're not right now, um, or they weren't you know, a few months ago. So if we, if my friends in the legislature said that all teachers in low-performing schools have to have a one-year contract and one-year contract only, would your teachers feel like that was more respectful or less respectful? The good teachers would be amazing anyway. Um, the teachers that are struggling or mediocre, they would feel that sense of urgency like, hey, I gotta kick myself in the butt here and I gotta improve. Um, yeah, someone feels demoralized, but no more demoralized than what they're currently feeling. I think I'd like to see something come out of this committee that, that, is, that is fair and equitable across the board, and, and let's forget it having to be the same across the board, because fair and equitable doesn't necessarily mean the same. I think, um, and I, this is, I think where we may differ if this if it is a bit of a difference. Um, being in a low performing school before, I think the pressure of because we at one point were at this place where I think the teachers were pretty much being evaluated year to year um, because of the mandates that we were under, and I think that put them in a place where they did not do as well as they could have or should have because they spent more time trying to internalize, okay, so this happened, what, what's next? And so, okay, wait a minute, so that didn't add up, so that's not gonna work, or at the end of this year, I don't have this, then I'm out, or, you know. And like you said, the really good teachers, for them that's not a problem because they've been doing it and even when you get new curriculum they know how to slice it look at the unpacking know how to teach it and present it and put it out there but because of all that pressure they don't have the time now 
to, well then, to share how to do it with the novice teachers who may have been struggling because their focus was making sure that I had my job at the end of the year. Um, I think we're in a different place now because we've been working with the new curriculum for some time and you know it's ours, we own it, and it's not in that trial phase, so it may look a little bit different, but I think in the beginning um, that would have been a major impact because the teachers would have felt like, whoa, and I'll just say three things. Number one, uh, keep talking about the growth. That's huge. Uh, number two, um, and part of that, make sure that in all the initiatives that DPI does and that the legislators do, that they consider the, the schools who are um, the, the neediest schools because we have the most paperwork, we have the most need, so always consider them. And um, number three, instead of focusing on low performing, which is a negative conversation, maybe turn it into high honoring. The consider, change your dialogue so that we're focusing on, instead of a negative, let's start thinking about the positive move and would that cause us to, to accelerate because we're focusing on the positive versus this low performing. At the end of the day, uh, if we continue on this model, low performing is gonna be always at some point. Uh, it's going to be those in need. So consider, could you start changing the labels and wake whoever's making this legislation awake and say, hey, guess what? North Carolina's starting something different and the states start turning to us instead of us turning to the state, other states and drive that. If we do that, that might change the way we think about schools. So we're going to be unequal in our time here. We don't have time for all the rest of the tables to ask a question. We have time for one more question. It's going to go to this table, and this will be our last chance. Of all the things that have been suggested to you as strategies to turn around low-performing schools, what would you say has been a complete waste of time or something you'd do away with? Just be honest. <laughs> really. That panel be honest? I think they will. <laughs> <laughs> because this is probably lack of time to think it through all the way and I'm hoping I don't look like this but um, for me I think it was the push initially to move teachers out who just didn't cut it but for me you know I was trying to figure out what is it what does it mean to cut it so if you're going to have me get rid of teachers who are low performing or not making the grade then explain to me or lay out for me what it is um, that should look like and not just the evaluation instrument because of course with that that's subjective because as an administrator I may truly understand what those elements of the proficiency look like and accomplish because I've been to professional development and I've had practice with it and I've sat down with some other leaders who showed me but for someone else who did it they're just cutting the teachers down because this school is low performing and I know these teachers don't know what they're doing and so this is developing because I don't see this this and this and this but who says that this this and this and this is what a truly effective teacher looks like so I think just a clear explanation of you know what a teacher who's not cutting the mustard looks like and if there's such a thing I mean I know there are teachers who are not doing a bang up job all the time, but then are we doing what we need to do as leaders in the building and outside the building to grow them so that they can be great teachers? Because I can't teach all the kids in my building. I've got to grow the ones that have the teachers so that they can be the great teachers that they are developing to be. Um, the current requirements that have occurred so far um, some districts are interpreting some things a little bit differently as I've talked to other principals across the state but um, when we had to submit and um, our school improvement plan with some addendums and things like that that didn't help us at all um, that was kind of a big waste of time and then um, the additional observation requirements have not helped our school at all 
Um, we were already doing observations to change it midstream and to add additional observations, not that it was more work, but that it does not change instruction. Like if, if you're a good administrator, you're giving the right feedback you need to give anyway. So this didn't change our feedback process. I understand why it was put into place. If I worked at NCDPI and was told that here, we gotta make this legislation happen, we don't have a choice, here are the things that are options, I don't know what I would have said. Um, and so I have a great amount of empathy for those that work at DPI and, and are putting those things into place, but they have not helped me as the building principal in improving instruction. Because there is an instruction deficit in my school, but those additional requirements have not helped me whatsoever, and I completely agree with Mr. Hall in saying that they have pulled me from instructional responsibilities that would make a difference in instruction. Uh, I, I agree. I, I preach to my teachers, and, and we try to get teachers to understand we've got to differentiate for our students. I don't feel like we're being differentiated. Um, <clears throat> the state needs to trust our superintendents, that they have, a, they have the foot on the ground, they know what's going on, they can deem what support schools need. What support I, my low performing school needs is different from the low performing school that's on the other side of town for me needs. Um, and, and so one size does not fit all. Goes back to my equity comment. Um, somebody mentioned uh, universities. You know, I, I truly believe if anybody wants to be a teacher or wants to be a principal, their, their student teacher, their internship needs to happen in a low performing school. Um, and, and I think if, if we don't do enough to change the atmosphere. Those are the teachers we're going to get. So I want them as a student teacher so I can start preparing them for when they become um, my teachers. Um, you know, that's a tough question because I worked under Dr. Ashley when we were in transformation and she was gracious to consider my complaints and allow us to adjust as a result of that. But I would say, I think... Um, I think the listening to my peers in Union County, they would say these super evaluations, not having any work with that, they would say that's, I think, what you're talking about. For me personally, all, uh, anything that interferes with instruction needs to be really vetted before we put it in place. So if we're going to add assessments, then things have to be pulled off the table. If we're going to add these, maybe change the teacher evaluation instrument so that it reflects instruction more and less of this other uh, thing. So anything that affects the time teachers spend with students in instruction and moving to a more um, uh, not the summative but the assessment that goes right there as the teacher's teaching that's what the focus should be versus on um, we've got trc and dibbles going on then we have WIDA going on then we have bog we have eogs and if you begin to total all those days up, that begins, and I know this new legislation at the federal level is going to affect that, but let's be honest and ensure it does and make sure that instruction is the number one priority and that we assess as we teach. And if we do that, I bet we'll see test scores rise.